to the final video of chapter six, talking about random variables. So, uh, this video, we're actually discussing the binomial and geometric random variables. So in this, you've got to be able to, don't know what just happened. Okay, in this, you've got to be able to um, determine and understand binomial distributions as well as calculate their mean and standard deviation, as well as finding the probabilities of geometric random variables. This little portion down here, which if I knew where my pen went, I would write it up. Okay, so I'll just show you. This little portion right here, um, uh, using the normal approximation of the binomial distribution to calculate probabilities, this isn't tested, so even though I've got a slide for it and it's in your printout, I don't, uh, I will show you that this is not information you need to know, so I've got a big old X on that screen. All right, so if we've got the binomial setting, so before we even go into a new acronym, consider the following scenarios. So if you toss a coin five times, and you count the number of heads. We've got a scenario there. What about if I spin a roulette wheel eight times and I record how many times the ball lands on a red slot? And finally, what if I think of taking a random sample of 100 babies born in the United States uh, in US hospitals and I count the number of female babies? Okay, so if I consider these three uh, scenarios, what do I notice that they have in common? In, F, in effect, I noticed that there is a fixed number. I tossed my coin five times. I spun the, real, the roulette wheel eight times. I took a sample of 100 babies, okay? I was looking for a fixed answer every time. I wanted to know the heads. I wanted to know the red slot, and I wanted to know the females. I was looking for a fixed, what we call success, every time. And uh, each trial was independent. Every time I flipped that coin, it reset. It wasn't, you know, the next outcome wasn't dependent on the first. Every time I spun the roulette wheel, it reset. And every time I took a sample of 100 babies, each baby is its own new trial. Okay, you know, the next baby's birth has nothing to do with the first baby's birth. So these are um, what we call binomial random variables. And, you know, you can read all of this, but to make our life easier, we've got a new acronym. So our previous acronyms were cussing, dealing with quantitative data, duffing, dealing with two variable data and scatter plots. And now when we deal with binomials, we're going to bins. Pretty easy. Binomial bin a little bit easier. So B stands for binary. Is it um, yes or no? Is it success or failure? However you define it. With the coin, is it, you know, heads is a success, tails is a failure. With the roulette, he, uh, red slot is success, black slot is failure. With the babies, female is success, male is failure. Okay, and so I stands for independent. Are the trials independent of one another? Great. N stands for number. Are your, the number of trials, was it fixed in advance? I'm not going to say I'm going to toss my coin five times and then I didn't get the probability I want, so I'm going to toss it five more times. It doesn't work that way. I had to have a set number of trials to begin with for this to be truly binomial. And finally, S, success. There is the same probability of success of each trial. When I flip that coin, I have a 50-50 chance of getting heads. Same amount of success. Yes, in subsequent, it te you know technically changes a little bit, but the reality of it is, is each individual trial has that same probability. Same with spinning the roulette wheel, black or red, 50-50 shot. I don't actually know the numbers on a roulette. I don't understand roulette, so I can't give you any more than that, but I can go black and red, 50-50 shot. Male or female, 50-50 shot. So same probability of success in each trial. It doesn't have to be 50-50, but your probability of success in each trial has to be the same. So again, bins. If you are ever asked a question as to whether it is a binomial random variable, it must meet all four categories. Is it binary? Is it independent? Uh, are your trials already numbered and fixed? And are the, is the probability successful? The probability of success the same in each trial? All right. So jumping on in, here's another definition we should understand. So we understood what makes a binomial setting, but inside the binomial setting, we've got two you know, vocab words that relate to them, the binomial random variable and the binomial distribution. And that's just defining um, the vocab words that you might see. So your binom binomial random variable is whatever variable, typically X, but whatever variable you have associated with that binary random variable, that success or failure variable. And then finally, um, your binomial distribution is the probability distribution. So just, you know, new words that make sense because we've already really discussed them. So, um, 
They gave you parameters, N and P, blah, blah, blah. You can read that for yourself or check your, your packet. But let's just jump on in into a question. So in the purple, I've just got, you know, just a reminder, binomial settings, you can define a random variable as the number of successes. And we're interested in finding the probability distribution or the binary distribution. So we've got this example that's technically on page 388, and I lied. It's technically on page 390 of your textbook. Each child of a particular pair of parents has a probability of 0.25 of getting a type O blood type. Genetics tell me that uh, children receiving genes from each of their parents will receive them independently. The genes I get from mommy will not be the genes I get from daddy and vice versa. So we know that these are independent. If the parents have five children, the count X of children with type O, so we know our, our X uh, random variable is going to be children with type O blood setting, is a binomial random variable. How do we know it's a binomial? Well, we can bin it ourselves in just a second. Um, we can triple check, but we're given that N is equal to five, so we have five trials, and a probability of 0 0.25 success in each trial. So let's check our bins really quickly. B, binary. Yeah, uh, you know, is it success or failure? Do you have type O or not? Great, it is. I, independent. Yes, I received these genes independently, so it is an independent concept, okay? Um, N, number of trials is set. Five trials, five kids, it's already set. And S, success. Is my probability of success the same in each trial? It is 25% in each trial. Yes, there's a 25% chance that each child will have a type O blood type. This is a BINS, this is a binomial setting, so this can be a binomial random variable. In this setting, a child with type O is a success and a child with another type is a failure. We kind of guessed that for ourselves. So what is the probability of X equals 2? What is the probability that 2 of the, um, sorry, what is the probability that X equals 2? We'll just leave it at that. So we're going to jump on into this question. I'm just triple checking that they didn't give us any information in the textbook that's not written here. Um... Okay, so they just briefly mentioned how would you read what is P of, what is probability of X equals zero? What is the probability that none of the five children? Here we're looking at P of X equals two. What is the probability of two uh, children having type O blood type, et cetera, et cetera? So let's go ahead and create the most basic pattern. So how would I get two out of the five? So that would be a success, a success, a failure, failure, failure. Great. So let's look at those probability values. So if a success is 0 .0, or sorry, 0.25, then a failure must be 0.75. So I can plug those values in and ta-da, I get my probability of a success, a success, failure, failure, failure is 0 0.02637. But that's not the only combination, is it? My children don't have to be born as type O, type O, not type O, not type O, not type O. They could be another combination. It could go type O, not type O, not type O, type O, not type O. And so I've went ahead and written out every single possible combination. There are 10 of them. Does each arrangement still have the same probability? Man, where I really lost my pen, guys, and that sucks. Ah, found it. Okay. All right. So uh, you can see, you know, if I did this as um, success, success, failure, 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 that's the same one right here. So it has a probability of 0 .2, uh, 0.02637. What about here? 0 0.25 times 0 0.75 times 0 0.25 times 0 0.75 times 0 0.75 is still the same value. No matter how I rearrange these combinations, my probability stays the same of getting two out of five children having a type O blood type. So in order to account for actually the P of X equals two, I have to account for every combination. So I'm going to take each individual probability and multiply it by the total number of combinations. And in this instance, it's 10. And so I end up with a true P value, a true probability of two out of five children being 0.2637 or 26.4%. So there's a 26.4% chance that um, there's a 26.4% chance that two of the five couples children will have a type O blood type. There's my end sentence. All right. In that previous uh, example, we did any arrangement of three of two S's and three F's. So we had the same probability, and all we had to do was multiply it by the total number of combinations. That was great. So using that same information, you notice that the math didn't truly change. We just had to account for the combinations. So 
based off of this, they created this, this theory, this concept, they created some formulas. So we're going to look at some formulas right here. You can generalize P of, you know, your ran your binomial random variable equaling X, where X is the number of, or K, sorry, K is the number of successful trials, then your probability is arranged by this formula right here. Number of arrangements times P to the K times the quantity 1 minus P raised to the N minus K. Great. This formula right here, uh, the number of ways K of arranging K successfully is also called the binomial coefficient. So specifically, this right here, the number of arrangements is represented by this, the binomial coefficient. And if this is represented by this formula right here, and the exclamation point represents factorials. But you can totally solve this for yourself, and eventually you'll recognize some of the binomial coefficients and what they just are. Five, five will always be one, et cetera, et cetera. However, the TI Inspire is so wonderful. It calculates your binomial coefficient for you. So does the TI-84. Um, and so we will go over calculator stuff in class. If you are unable to get into class, you can either Google it for yourself or in the back of our textbook, there are TI Inspire tutorials for every single chapter. So I would just focus on the TI Inspire tutorial for chapter six. Um, they review how to calculate mean and standard deviation if you put in all of your data plots, data points into lists and spreadsheets. And they also go over how to calculate the binomial coefficient, binomial probability, and the geometric probability. But we'll, we'll go, we will go over those together in class. So the binomial coefficient um, counts the number of different ways. And so we set it out for ourselves that, you know, there were 10 unique possibilities of type O blood type. But, um, you know, you can't always calculate, you know, just do combination sets to figure out your number of combinations. Sometimes you have massive sample sets and, you know, they're massive combination sets, so you need the math to do it for you. And so, you know, you can either calculate it yourself using the formula or you can just let the calculator do it for you. I recommend that. So the calculator will calculate this coefficient and this probability. And so you kind of just put those together to get your, um, oh, I went backwards to get your values. And so just breaking this down again, this is the number of arrangements of success. So this is what I keep calling our combinations. This is the probability that you were given and it's raised to the total number of successes you're looking for. So if you recall, that was 0 0.25 squared. We had that. Then we did the probability of the failure. In the, our instance, it was 0 0.75. And it's the opposite of what you have left. So if I had a total number of five trials, um, then what's left over, if two of them must be successful, what's left over is three. So again, I'm breaking this down. And this first value was 10. So I'm breaking down our example based off of this formula. So you can clearly see, even though the formula looks ugly and scary and messy, it really is as simple as breaking it down down by, you know, the number of combinations times the probability raised to the number of successes times the anti-probability raised to the number of failures. I mean, that's in essence what we're talking about right there. But again, we're going to use a calculator. So here are some basic steps for how to find binomial probabilities every time. First, you're going to state your distributions, values of, of interest. You know, you're going to declare your binomial random variable. You're going to declare your probability, the number of trials, blah, blah, blah. You're going to make everything nice and clear. Then you're going to calculate uh, doing either. You're going to calculate the binomial probability formula or you're going to use your calculator. Okay, so in this particular example, I'm pretty sure they've got the formulas written out, um, but, you know, I am going to focus on the calculator version in class and then finally answer whatever question they asked of you. So here we have an example that is um, relating still to, uh, do, 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 do. okay, here we are. Here we have an example that's still relating to those type O blood types. And so each child of a particular pair of parents has a probability 0.25 type O. We know that. We know that we have five children. And so that's our number of trials. So find the probability that exactly three of the five children have here we go. Exactly three of the five children have type O. And then part B, we're going to say, should we be surprised if more than three of the children have type O? In order to find this, you need PX is greater than three. And so if you're looking along in your textbook, this is on page 393. Um, and so let's go ahead and dive on in. So the very first thing it told us to do was in order to solve these, we were going to state our information, 
calculate and then answer our question. So stating our information, we are going to say that X is the number of children with type O blood type. We know X has a binomial distribution with N equals 5 and P equals 0 0.25. So we've stated everything we know. Great. Now let's do some calculations. So this is our total number of combinations. We have an N value of 5 and a K value of three, and that's the number of successes we're looking for, the number of successes we're looking for. Again, it's gonna match this number right here, the number of successes we're looking for. This is the probability uh, raised to the power of successes, so 0.25 raised to the power of three. This is the anti-probability raised to the power of failure, so 0.75 squared. So we end up with the uh, 10 times 0.25 cubed times 0.75 squared, and you get a probability of 0.08789 or 8.8%. Um, so let's go ahead and do part B. Um, uh, actually, before I do part B, I thought there was a sentence written up. Let's go ahead and write our sentence just very so we know there is a 8.8 or 9% chance that exactly three of the five children will have a type of blood type. Now, I know sometimes y'all like to see these written out, so that's why I went ahead and wrote it for you. All right, so let's do part B. Should I be surprised if I have more than uh, three children with a type O blood type? Well, if three children was already at an 8% chance, a 9% chance, maybe I should be surprised, but let's do the math to figure out the answer. So, again, we would have used a calculator, but here I've set it up. So P being greater, P, the probability of X being greater than three means that you're actually looking at a probability of X being four plus the probability of X being five. So really, this is my first setup. Then I put in each value. Uh, the probability of X being four has a binomial coefficient of five, four, <coughs> a success of 0.25 raised to the fourth, an anti-success <coughs> of 0.75 raised to the first power. A probability of combination 5 out of 5 would be 0.25 to the 5th power and 0.75 to the 0th power. Anything raised to the 0th power will always be the number 1. So this is going to, you know, disappear out eventually. And um, a binomial coefficient of 5 over 5 will, again, also even out. There's only one combination of that set. So I plug that into my calculator, and I end up with 0 0.01563. There is a 1.6 chance. There's only a 1.6 chance that more than three of their children, four or five children, will have a type O blood type. So, yes, the parents should definitely be surprised. A 1.5% chance is minute. They should absolutely be surprised. Ah, here's our wrap-up. There is the sentence. Okay. Thought I had two. My apologies. All right, moving forward. How would I calculate the mean and standard deviation for a binomial distribution? Okay, so um, we're given information here, that same distribution about the number of children with type O blood type. They did all the probabilities of uh, zero children getting it, one child getting it, two child getting it, three, four, and five. Okay, so we can look at the shape. So again, all these calculations were done using the same a concept and example and formulas that we just did in the previous examples. And so the shape is that it's skewed to the right. Okay, so again, we can use our cussing to describe binomials. So we know that we can do this. So we're going to go ahead and cuss. Uh, sorry, we know that we can use by uh, cussing to describe random variables. So we're going to go ahead and cuss. So the, our shape is skewed to the right. It is more likely that you'd have zero, one, or two children with a type O blood type. Our center is about at one. You can see that, you know, one is our highest point. Um, but you can also see that at one, you've got... Oh, man. Okay. Um, we don't want to talk about the mean. We can absolutely uh, calculate the mean, which we did here, um, because we know how to calculate the mean of random variables, so we use that same information. But we're going to use the median because it's skewed. Because it was skewed, we ended up looking at the median value, and so since the most repeated value was 1, that is our center. Talking about spread, we're going to talk about the variance and standard deviation. So again, you can use the same calculations we did in 6.1 and 6.2, calculating random variables, means, and standard deviation. And... Um,
unusuals, I don't really see anything that would you know pop out at me as an unusual. So I'm just gonna go ahead and wrap that screen up. Moving forward, uh, there are some formulas, so we could calculate it like this. However, because I know it is a binomial random variable, we have these two unique formulas. I can actually calculate the mean, multiplying it by the number of trials by the probability of success, and I can actually calculate my standard deviation or you know the variance if we squared it, but the standard deviation by the square root of that mean times the anti-probability. Oh my God, they've got another announcement. Mr. Biden, uh, the technology committee, technology committee. Okay, so remember, these only work for binomial distributions. It doesn't work because it's a random variable. It doesn't work because it's going to be geometric. It doesn't work because it's normal. It works because it's binomial and only binomial. So you will never use these formulas for anything else except binomial random variables, mean and standard deviation. So if I'm looking at an uh, example on page... Uh, where you at, Mr. Ballard? Bullard. Okay, 399. Um, they are, you're looking at Mr. Bullard's AP statistics class, and he has 21 students. Um, we know that you have a probability of one third chance of correctly identifying the different, different types of water uh, by guessing. You know, because he's asking his kids to tell which whether it's tap water or bottled water. And N is going to be 21 because we have 21 students, so there are 21 trials. So can I calculate mean and standard deviation based off of that? I sure can. So the formula for mean, again, is your trials by your probability. So 21 times 0.3 repeating is 7. And your standard deviation is going to be the square root of that mean, so seven, times the anti-probability. So instead of one-thirds, it's two-thirds. So we end up with um, seven times two-thirds and square root that you get 2.16. So if we were guessing, we'd, ex you know, we'd expect about one-third of the students to guess correctly. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if the activity were repeated many, many times with groups of 21 students just guessing, the number of correct identifications would differ from the average of seven by 2.16. So they've given you your standard deviations. And again, that is the same wrap up about standard deviation we have done since the dawn of time. No, I'm just kidding. Since um, we have started statistics and learning about standard deviation, it always is about that difference from the mean. You tell me the difference and you give me information about the formula, the information, the problem. And since we're talking about random variables, you're going to tell me that if this activity was repeated many, many, many times, you're always going to mention that this number, numerous repetitions. Okay. Um, so let's talk about that 10% condition rule. So you can read up on this page, but really when you take a simple random sample of size N with a population from original N, you can use the binomial distribution model to count the successes. So, you know, can I uh, take a binomial distribution and model it to real world sampling? That's in essence what they are kind of referencing here. And I think I don't have an example of the 10%. But, darn, I thought I did. Okay, I do. It's on page 402, but I don't have a slide for it. Um, so perhaps in my addendum video or in class, we'll go over that. So I do want to go over the example on page 402. All right, so uh, here is the stuff. You don't need to know how to do normal approximations for binomial distribution in AP statistics. It's an important thing to know for statistics, but it's not important for AP stats. So this would be on you if you want to learn this information. And finally, let's talk about geometric settings. So we talk about bins and binomial settings, but what happens when the number of trials um, isn't fixed or what happens when you're just repeating the behavior to get your success. I don't know the success or it's not a set success. Um, I want to repeat it until I get that success. And that's what we call geometric. Again, if I've got a geometric setting, then of course I have geometric random variables and geometric distribution. You can read up on those just to see if there's any differences. Um, it is important to know Basically, it's important to know the difference between binomial and geometric and neither. And I would recommend that you go to Khan and do their practice under 
under stats, under geometric settings, there was something about um, comparing binomial versus geometric, and you it gives you um, example studies, and you have to kind of say, is this binomial, is it geometric, or is it neither? I think that's a really good practice setting for questions, or you know, if you have to do it more than once, but I think it's a really good practice setting to really get the definition between bi binomial and geometric. You just see a few different types, and you're like, okay, I'm starting to pick up. Binomial is always going to bend, and geometric is going to be, if you're just keep on trying until you get that chance that success probability that you're looking for so if we're looking at the example on page 405 and 406 uh, the lucky day game so um, is this your lucky day you know they gave the teacher gave students uh, what are those called a you know like pretended like we had um, Fortune cookies. Oh, my God. I couldn't think of the word. Pretended like we had fortune cookies, but really we used a random number generator to select stuff. And so um, you're, you're kind of gambling with numbers and they're checking it out. So you can read up on that activity on page 405. But we wanted to really discuss the geometric setting of this activity. So the random variable is going to be Y and it's the number of guesses it takes to correctly match your lucky day. And what is the probability the first student guesses correctly, the second, the third, and what is the probability of the case student? So any numbered student. So first we're gonna calculate the probability of Y equals one, and we're going to use our geometric random uh, formula, which have I shown that to you yet? I haven't, okay, so this is an investigative task so we can create our formula, okay. So if I wanna know the probability of Y equaling one seventh. So one out of seven days, so you know, where's my, uh, probability. Probability of y equals uh, 2, I guess it, the, sorry, the, se the second student guesses correctly, then that would be a 6 out of 7 times 1 seventh, probability of 3, and et cetera, et cetera. So you can kind of see where these values and how this pattern eventually represents this formula down here. So the probability formula for geometric versus binomial, A, doesn't have a coefficient because we're not dealing with combinations because we don't have a set number of trials, um, but it does have a similar formula. Here you have that, where's my pen? Here you have that anti um, probability, but this time instead of K minus N, because we don't know the number of trials, it's just K minus one times the actual probability. And uh, so let's go ahead and see what that looked like. And so here they've already done each probability. So probability, the first student guess, probability, the second student guess, third student, fourth student, fifth, sixth, and so on and so forth. Um, so we can go ahead and cuss this out. Here's the shape. It is heavily skewed to the right. You are way more likely to uh, approach value one. You're way more likely to guess in the first half uh, than you are to guess in the second half or the latter half. We can get the mean and we guess that it would take seven guesses. We can get the spread of our standard deviation and we can keep on going. So how did I calculate the mean and how did I calculate the standard deviation? So the mean was calculated using this formula down here. It is simply, your mean is simply gonna be one divided by P, your probability. And that's how we got seven so quickly. Um, oops, go back, go back, go back. And our standard deviation we calculated uh, we don't have a set formula. I believe that came from our calculated values. Yeah, I think they they did out all of the successes or an infinite value, and they did like a, a list and spreadsheet calculation for their standard deviation. So. What does all this mean? We guessed that we expect that it would take seven guesses to get our first success. And since the standard deviation is 6.48, if the class plays uh, the lucky duck, the lucky day game many, 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 many times, then the number of homework problems a student would receive would differ from the average by 6.48. Um, and so you know, if you wanted to kind of wrap up about that lucky day game, so some teacher gives 10 problems for homework, or you can play the lucky day game. And so um, any student is selected at random and asked to pick a day of the week. And if um, they, they use a random technology generator, if to pick a day of the week as well, if the student and the technology pick the correct day, the class only has one homework problem. If they pick 
the wrong day, they'll, then the teacher moves on to a second student and um, then they get two homework problems and then a third student, then they get three homework problems, a fourth student, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's kind of what that lucky day game was. That's why there's first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So what's the probability that the very first student who walks up to that teacher guesses Monday and then the, the random number generator also pulls up Monday, then you know that's a very low chance of um, true success, but in those first few guesses, you have a high chance of success, and that's why it is rated as such. So here's what we did. We talked about binomial. We bins it, you know, binary, independent, uh, number of trials, and success is always the same. We learned how to compute and interpret. We are going to focus on using the calculator to grab the coefficient and grab the probability, putting those together. We know how to calculate mean and standard deviation of binomials and how to interpret them. And we understood what the difference is between a geometric and a binomial. We know that we don't need to know normal approximation, but that's on you if you want to learn that. That's all I got for you guys.